Charles? What's going on? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just, why are you? What happened? I didn't mean to do it. Do what? I didn't mean to do it. Slow down. Tell me what happened. You just came and I didn't know. And? Who? There was this guy. Who? Some guy I owe money. He came and trashed our place tonight. I thought you gave that up. Quite the image of a dad who says, give me your t-shirt. It was hard not to look at his eyes as he laid on the floor as they handcuffed him. Makes you wonder what would go through the son's head as he lives his life in freedom while his dad has paid the price for his mistakes. Sometimes when we look at Jesus, we forget that it was love that put him on the cross. He actually told them, you don't take me, I give my life. I could call 10,000 angels, destroy this world, set myself free. But I'm hanging here because of love. And I think it's around Easter, it's a great time for us to to remember what the cross actually is. You see, there are two stories of the cross. The first story is the historical story. This is shown to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there are other books that are out there and people that have referenced Jesus. So the historical Jesus is a proven fact. 
There is no way anybody could say Jesus did not live, die, and rise again. Hundreds of witnesses saw him. But there is another view of the cross that many believers are not aware of, and that is the spiritual view. One is the physical view of his physical body, walking the planet for three and a half years of recorded time, and then he goes to the cross and dies, and then we don't see anything for a little while. He goes into the tomb, and, and all of a sudden he rises again. And, but when you understand that God begins to, sh God shows us in the Bible what we call the story of the cross to the throne. What took place in when he died on the cross to when he rose into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father? Because it is not the historical Jesus that sets us free. It is not the historical Jesus that even, uh, we, we know it's real, but that's not the story. When you begin to get into God's word and you begin to understand that when Jesus died on the cross, that your sin, he became sin. No wonder he says, and it's recorded, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he became sin, took the sin of the world. And of course, according to the Old Testament, wherever there is sin, then the curse of the law comes. And he died. The curse killed him. Your curse, my curse, killed him. The Bible says he spent three and a half days in death. A lot of things happened in there. And then when he arose again, he arose to give us a new life. He had won it for you and I, and he sits at the right hand of the Father today. This this teaching, which I could never cram into the 16 minutes ahead of me, but to make you aware as a believer or maybe as someone who has never really considered Jesus because you've only known the historical Jesus and the fact that he walked and he healed people and he walked on the water and he multiplied food and, and he was really wonderful to people who had messed up lives, he didn't judge them. This historical Jesus is, a, is this an amazing man. But did you know that whenever you look at the historical Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that this is the way God is? The word's very clear that when you looked at Jesus, you saw the very essence, the very God of the universe. This is the way God works with people. What does he do? He, he's not judging because his judgment went on Jesus. You and I have an opportunity to live an incredible life. And we must, must, must begin to study this out. So many people have, have understood, and it's really true, that, that to have Jesus is a free gift. To give him your life, there's nothing you can do to earn it. But did you know that once you give your life to Jesus... There are some things you need to learn. There's some things you need to know. And if you do, you can live at what the Bible says in kingdom principles. You will learn to work the very supernatural power of God that Jesus, as Jesus walked the planet, so you and I can walk the planet. But 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study. The Bible says in Philippians 2, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And in Psalms, it 119.11, it says that hide God's word in your heart. It is showing this ability of research. Get into the word. Find out what Jesus has done for you. And then begin to live in that power. Today, most of Christianity only sees Jesus as Savior. So they believe they're saved. They're going to go to heaven when they die. And that is true. But they have not understood that he brought heaven to earth. And that you could have days of heaven on earth. Now that doesn't mean we don't have an enemy. It doesn't mean this earth isn't fallen. It doesn't mean it's not filled with sickness and death and disease. And, and a bunch of people who will stab you in the back and everything else. The world's got stuff. But that his strength, his love, his blessing would even work with you down here. But few 
will research it. Few will spend time. If I was to ask people, just explain to me, please, what did Jesus do on the cross? They would just say, he died for my sins. Now, some might be able to say, well, when he rose again, I have a new life. But yet, they could never give you scripture. They, could, they, they have never done the work. Yet, in the cross to the throne, when you begin to read and go through the word on this, and it becomes a realization to your heart, that is where miracles work. So many people who are believers, they have periodic flashes of God's favor, they think. Periodic flashes of, of the miraculous. And yet they don't see it consistently in their life because Jesus preached a different message. And so did John the Baptist. He preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is what John the Baptist preached. Jesus came along and preached and taught his disciples to preach, the kingdom of God is near. And wherever he went, supernatural things happened. Powerful things happened, healings and miracles. And did you know that all of these things are reserved for you and I? And that we are Christians, Christians, which means like Christ. We are to follow him. We are to live just like Jesus taught us to live. This message is so powerful that listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 19. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The things and whatever you don't allow or forbid on earth will be the things that God does not allow, forbidden, bound in heaven. And the things, whatever you allow, permit, and loose on the earth will be the things that God allows, permits, and looses in heaven. All right, this... This verse just kind of blows people's minds. It's not about how to bind the devil. It's not a binding, loosing prayer of the devil. This is literally just showing that when your free will, you see, everyone here's got free will. You're allowed to do what you want, when you want, how you want, where you want, and God is not going to come in and force you to serve him and force you to be good. You have free will because you are made in the likeness and the image of God. You get to choose what you want to do, where you want to do it, how you want to do it. You can reject him. You can be as evil as you want. You can be as good as you want. Now, there's consequences to everything you do, but free will is yours. But when we begin to understand the cross to the throne, we begin to choose Jesus. And when you begin to not just give your life to him as Savior, but you begin to learn and you begin to connect your heart with his heart. You see, this thing about being a follower of Christ isn't about just your legal standing. Can you imagine if you married somebody and studied all the laws you could about what's legally involved in your marriage. So you and your spouse talk, and yep, today we're going to talk about uh, when we accumulate stuff and how it's all of ours, and this is what marriage... No one really cares about you knowing all the laws of the marriage, the legal standing of marriage. They want you to actually have a relationship. And many Christians are like this. Thank God they know the, the law and the legal standing of a Christian, that you are bound for heaven and it's yours. But yet so few people know how to connect with God at the heart level and then begin to walk like Christ in every arena of life. Did you know that your marriage can have Christ at the center and his power flowing in your marriage? Did you know that your physical body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, can have Christ at the center of your faith in your body and health and healing can flow? In your body? Did you know that at the center of your career, your finances, and what you're building with the rest of your life, Jesus can be right there with you. You can be in him, and the very resources of heaven are yours. The very creativity of God is reserved for you and for I. Few understand this, so we tend to give our life to Christ, and then the teaching is that, you know, um, we just kind of get through here and get to heaven one day in the sweet by and by. But actually, the Bible says, if you seek first the kingdom of God, his way of doing things, that all these things will be added unto you. When Jesus left in John 14, he told his disciples, I'm leaving. But Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to teach you these things.
And I want to challenge you today. I want to speak to believers for just a minute. You know, we tend to be a little bit lazy. Okay, I know, if you're like me, and we all are kind of like this. We just tend to, we got, I got saved, and if I need Jesus, I'll pray. Um, and, but to really begin to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Well, what does that mean? You're saying now, you said it was free, now you say you got to study. No, to be in the family's free. See, my kids, I got five kids, they all got into the family free. Okay, they all got in free. But I got news for you. For our family to work properly with joy, discipline, to be able to live seven people in one house, it takes learning to get along, understanding each other, learning to submit to the disciplines of the home so that one person isn't taking more than the other. And these things are not to get into the family. These things are to make the family work. So you've given your life to Christ. Did you know that the very presence of God, the very power of God can be yours and that he would flow through you in every case? You just need to build this relationship with him. Holy Spirit will help you. You know, the Bible says he's your comforter. And I love this fact. You can become comfortable with the very power of God. You can become comfortable with the blessing of God. I was teaching one day at a conference to business people, and it was Christian business people, and so I was talking about the, incredibly, um, the incredible advantage that we have because Jesus is our source for everything. And, that we, and one guy put his hand up during Q&A, and he said, well, this is, this is just not fair at all. It's just, I mean, to say that Christians have an, un, it's an unfair advantage. Why would God give us an advantage and people in the world that they can't have? I said, that they can have them any time they want. But he's not worried about blessing people who aren't building his kingdom. Now, what's interesting is that if they put the principles to work, it works for them too. But you and I need to recognize that wherever you're struggling in life right now, that the blessing of God is there for you to use. Did you know that since the cross, for example, that Jesus is not deciding which miracles happen in your life? Whoa, what? What? Well, everyone thinks because it says you have not because you ask not that if your life doesn't have something, ask God, ask him again, ask him, ask him, ask him, ask him, ask him, and he's got to give it as though he's withholding it. But that's not true. In the new covenant, I could show you over and over again, and we haven't got time right now, that he has given you freely all things. And that not only has he given you all things that pertain to life and godliness, but he'll show you what he means by just looking at his promises. And the promises you find in the word are already given to you. So it's not a matter of begging, bugging, pleading with God to do something. It is literally learning the word until you connect with your heart at the heart level. And then it says, you'll speak to mountains or problems and they'll move. That you will walk in blessing and, and all the great things that God has for you and I. But yet so few people seem to get in and to get fascinated. The Bible, Jesus tells a story. He says, this guy buys pearls and he finds a pearl of great price and he sells all that he has just to have that pearl. That story is talking about the kingdom of God, finding Jesus and living in his kingdom. Yet today I wonder how many of us as believers kind of, you know, we, we've just taken for granted Jesus. And, and he's not this consuming passion where our world is built around this Jesus way. We want to know Jesus. We've so Christianized it. That's why I don't even like the word Christianity anymore because it doesn't mean anything. It's just a Gentile term that is talking about the religion of Christ. Well, I'm, I'm not into religion. I hate religion. But I'm into a relationship with Jesus. And my challenge is to you young people starting out your life, deciding your career, deciding who you're going to spend the rest of your life with as a spouse, career, all the things that you're going to live by. What are the things that you value? What is the character? Who do you want to be emotionally? Who do you want to be character-wise? And then move on that, that Jesus is here to help you live incredible lives. When people ask me, what is this year going to be like? I'll tell them. Whereas others will go, well, I'm hoping and praying and waiting and seeing. That's not even biblical. The Bible teaches us 
that we prophesy our futures from the very heart that is within us. That in our heart is our future. In our heart is our beliefs. In our heart is how we see ourselves. In our heart is the deepest beliefs as to how we see God. It's amazing to me the kind of Christian. I meet Christians who are angry. And the more I talk to them about God, they, they believe God's an angry God. And so because God's an angry God and they follow him, they become angry people. The God they believe in is who they become. And I'm so glad that someone sat me down and taught me the truth that God is love. That God is in love with you. And that he has made a way to not just get to heaven, but to learn to work the principles of the kingdom of God. In the Bible, you'll find two terms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And it'll say something like, you know, Jesus makes this comment. He says that if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. And you look at that verse and go, well, who can the world can be forgiven? But see, that's before the cross. See, if you don't know your Bible, people get it so messed up. Before Jesus died, you couldn't be forgiven unless you forgave. But after the cross, it says, forgive others as he has forgiven you. It's different now. Jesus changes everything. The cross, Jesus changes everything. And if you do not understand the changes that are in the new covenant, and you personally do not go in and begin to look at what Jesus has done for you and how you now can live a different life, you will pray Old Testament prayers, trying to mix the old covenant with the new covenant, and they're like oil and water. They don't mix. No wonder so many Christians. You know, the other day I put out a, uh, just a little quick blurb of five minutes where I did that little rant about people saying God's got the whole world under control. And so they put that, the media department put that out on my, on my Facebook and Instagram. It was just me saying, hey, stop saying God's controlling everybody, controlling everything, because he's not. The Bible doesn't say he is. You know, what are you going to tell that 12-year-old girl who's been chained to a bed for nine years and abused? God's in control? What are you going to tell the millions of children dying and starving in other countries or those who've been raped and beaten and whipped and, and all the horrible things that God's in control? Like, they don't even want to serve that kind of... You wouldn't believe the negativity that people, that Christians just came at me. False prophet. Someone tell that guy the scripture. He doesn't know the Bible. They just boom, 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 boom. Because Christians like to believe this kind of old new blend and they don't understand the cross to the throne they don't understand the love that god has for you they don't understand that because of jesus you have access to the very presence in the throne room of god that when you see jesus in the matthew mark luke and john that's how god is that they don't know that as jesus is seated at the right hand of the father we're seated with him what that means is that you have been given authority. Given authority. And that that authority works because it comes from Jesus. As you begin to look from the cross to the throne and you understand that there are new privileges that are now yours that weren't there before the cross. I was talking to a funeral director one time and it was right after he'd done a funeral with a, another uh, with a pastor and, and his congregation. and This pastor was sitting with the funeral director in the lead car. And as they were going, it was kind of quiet, so the pastor turns and says to the funeral director, and he's telling me the story. He looks at me and goes, yeah, he says, names the guy in the back in the hearse. He says, yeah, I was, I was with him the night he died. And uh, he was very frantic, very weepy, and he's begging me, is there any way that you can give me an assurance that I'll make heaven? And so this pastor, priest, and I'm not sure which, what religion it was, he looks at the funeral director who goes to our church, and he starts to laugh, and he goes, can you imagine? As if I can guarantee heaven for him. Well, the Bible's very clear that you can know you'll spend eternity 
and heaven because of Jesus. Yet there are people trained to teach congregations in seminaries, and they won't understand the cross to the throne. They'll understand the historical Jesus, but they stumble all over themselves when they begin to recognize that in this new covenant, this new agreement, that we no longer need a high priest as far as on the planet, but that we are priests. Jesus said that we are kings. Something new's taken place that few Christians seem to understand and fewer seem to walk in. The authority that goes with kingship, the access to the throne of God that goes with priesthood. Th these things are for the every believer. My time is up already, but I'm going to give you something to think about. The word Christian, you know, <laughs> Sorry if I wrecked it for you, but it doesn't mean much to me. Um, it just means you're born in a Christian country, you're, uh, you, know, you go to a Christian church. But I mean, sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian, like sitting in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> and so I like to look at it as a follower of Jesus Christ. And then there's a word that is used in the Bible that I'm going to ask you to consider. The word is disciple. Those I don't meet too many of, sorry. Disciplined followers of Jesus Christ who know their new covenant, who know what Jesus died to give them, and it wasn't just heaven. He died to give them a life so unique that the people of this planet would look at you and go, how do you have peace in the middle of that storm? And you don't brag about yourself. You tell them where your peace comes from. When the presence of God heals and restores, and they go, how did you see that? And you share the hope that you have, Jesus. Easter is about a new covenant with new principles. And the Bible says it is better than the old covenant. So anytime you can find something working in the Old Covenant, but you don't see it in the New Covenant, there's something wrong. Because everything in the New Covenant is better than everything in the Old Covenant. And so we've got to begin to study. And I'm going to challenge you to do that. I'm going to challenge you to make a decision that you begin to understand this New Covenant. Let me speak to believers now for a minute, which is just those who've made this decision to give yourself to Christ. One of the greatest hindrances I see in your world is you think you know, so you stop learning. And what you don't know is that all of the mysteries are in him. That when you get to know Jesus, you will never in your life reach the end of the most incredible, awesome, life-changing mysteries that are hidden in Christ and knowing Christ. And whatever you know so far is beautiful and wonderful, but there's so much more in this relationship with Jesus that will change you, change your life, give you a life so full of purpose. And that's why you can't afford to be this person. You know, often when I speak, uh, I'll just tell you the truth. I get people who don't think they can be taught anything. So if they happen to shake my hand and they like the message, they'll always say something like this. Thank you, Pastor. It was a great reminder. What they're really saying is, learned nothing, taught me nothing. Good reminder. I already knew that. And I know them, many of them personally, and what they think they know, they can't get to work for themselves. So do you know it if it's not working? You can say, oh, I already know how to ride a horse. Good, there's one is, go do it. Oh, oh, well, um, <clears throat> oh, uh, when we learn something, the Bible says, the Bible the definition of knowing something is you don't know it till you're experiencing it. You don't know it till you're working it. And if you don't learn to make those final steps of learning a truth and then working it, it'll cause great unbelief in your life because you'll never get it to work because you haven't pressed in. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Begin to hide his word in your heart so you walk out the best. Begin to literally work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not talking about you getting right with God. Jesus did that. It's talking about you learning the new covenant. It's talking about you learning to function in the supernatural all the time, every day. And that's my challenge to you this Easter, is stop looking at this as another religion, 
What do I need to do to get to heaven? What do I need to do to attend this church? I just tell me the things I can and can't do to go to your church, and then I'll know if I want to come. Well, there's nothing you have to do. All you've got to do is come find out about Jesus and let him do the rest. Father, I pray today that every one of us would make a decision that we hunger and thirst after a better relationship with you. That we know we don't have to earn your love, acceptance, or forgiveness. But that now that we have it, I just want to know you. I want to know you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I want to know what makes you smile, what makes you laugh. I want to spend my quiet times getting to know you, God. And I pray that every person here As a deer pants for the water, so my soul, our soul, would long after you. That every young man, every young woman, even now at this young age, would make a decision that Jesus will be the very center of my life. I pray for every mature man or woman who's maybe lived an entire life already would make a decision today. I will spend the rest of my life with you as my Lord and Savior. And I pray that the Bible will become the fascinating, passionate, interesting, life-changing book that you made it to be. With every head bowed for just a moment, I want to close my message down with a powerful prayer. This is a prayer that I prayed a number of years ago that changed my entire world. And I'd like to lead you in it. Now, God will never force himself into your world. He respects you. And he's given you free will. But if you ask him, you put into action an incredible miracle. This miracle is a transformation. It is literally a changing of citizenship. You become a member of God's family. You become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And his presence, his power comes inside of you. This prayer is simply you saying to him, I choose you. And I'm going to lead you in that prayer. This prayer is for two kinds of people. The first kind is someone who says, Pastor, uh, I think I've hardly darkened a church door. This is the first I've even heard about this. Like, really? It's for someone who doesn't believe they've ever given their lives to Christ. But then there's a second group of people I think you should pray this prayer as well. And that's for those who have tried this. And somewhere in your past, you were hurt or you failed miserably so full of guilt and condemnation you walked. But today, I think it's time to come back to Jesus when you realize you didn't understand him as well as you thought, that he still loves you. He still cares for you. He hasn't outed you. So before I lead this entire auditorium in this prayer, right from your seats, for all of those who would say, Leon, include me. Today, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Would just you folks open your eyes? And would you lift your hand up and just hold it up there where I can see it until I see it and then put it right back down? Thank you, 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 thank you. Others, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise you, Jesus. For those in the other, thank you, ushers are pointing towards hands. Thank you, ushers over there. In the other campuses of Springs, there's a leader at the front right now looking for your hand. This Jesus, who's so in love with you, he died for you, now wants to give you a life so amazing that he's going to be literally, Jesus, I came to give life and to give it to you more abundantly. He wants you to have that even before you get to heaven. So you have about three seconds before I pray. Just raise your hand at that man at the front, at that woman at the front right now in that church site. And let's all together pray with these amazing folks making this decision to accept Jesus as their Savior and their Lord because they are the only ones who can do that for themselves. Pray this out loud, all of us. Just say, Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus who died in my place. I give you my life. Come into my heart. I'm following you for the rest of my days. With your strength, 
in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Welcome to the family of God. That's how powerful, how wonderful that is.